And, and Sherry and Anthony, I know you, you think I've got my, my fangs out, and I haven't, because this is um, audience questions. And sadly, we've got a, a very strict um, timekeeper in my ear. So I do welcome hands. Let's have anyone who... Yes, there's a lady at the back. We can get a mic there. And um, any other hands? We'll just try and get a, a couple of... Thanks. Uh, yeah, one here. If there's one more, we might be able to squeeze in one more. Why don't you go for it, madam? Thanks. Hi. Um, my name is Dawn Payne. I work for Creative England. Um, who I'm hoping that Sherry knows. Um, I heard you also speak at Innovate um, UK's conference the other week as well. Um, part of what we do is actually very much look to develop creative businesses in the UK, try to take them on the journey from a start-up through to a scale-up, and then ultimately trying to be the next unicorn. What role do you think um, big businesses have to play within this ecosystem? Are you going to take all three questions or just do them one at a time? So I think, there's a, huge, I, I think there's a huge role. Um, if One of the things that we uh, put up there was that 82% of the, the smaller businesses find it hard to get procured from a, a big company. And the, you know, the old adage of you don't get fired for buying from IBM um, is actually not at all dangerous to hire from, a, to, to buy something and co-produce co co something with, uh, with a scale-up entrepreneur. Um, because they have been producing goods and selling them to customers for at least three years. And more than that, the customers, because the revenues are growing at 20% per annum for two years running, um, the, the arbiter of taste, the judge, are the customers who keep on buying more and more. So it is safe to buy from a, from a scale up. And you can almost be certain, if they're growing that fast, that there's something innovative about, about the product. Um, and there's a lot that we can do, and I think you guys are actually doing a really great way, great uh, way of giving the creative businesses in particular an articulation, also showing how it matters. The, I think you changed the way that you uh, probably did your marketing a little while ago, and I think you can now see the impact that creative businesses have on the on the economy as a whole. And if we can supercharge your your startups in, and your scale up so they grow further, um, we will all be deeply grateful for for what you're doing. But there's a huge role. Um, big companies not buying from small companies that are growing is is a cultural issue, which is why you said culture eats strategy. There's something that prevents you. Now, one of the things that prevents is an information gap. If the large companies could spot the, the small scale-ups that are growing, it would make it easier for them to decide that that one might be fast-tracked. Um, and it would also be easier to pick them for some of these matchmaking events that there are, where you're picking the fastest growing firms and you're clumping them together with the, the large corporates who might have a problem that um, needs to be solved. But once, it's all in the evidence, once you can find a scale up, then it becomes much easier for others to do, to do business with them. And the thing that prevents them from growing is skills and companies that want, that, that are able to find them. Because they don't have a very loud voice and they often don't have professional marketeers to help them find that voice either. And is George coming on that one or shall we move to the next one? I'm happy for you to move to the next one. Where is the next one? Thank you. Hello, um, it's Ellen, editor of the Marketing Society again. And my question is for Anthony. Um, I read that you had described setting up a new bank um, as being beaten up again and again. And I was wondering what, what you could tell us about what leaders need to know about being resilient. Um, yeah, it was one of those, most of my quotes are taken out of context or out of drinking. Um, <laughs> I forget. What, the journalist or you? Uh, yeah, probably, yeah, one <laughs> of us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I'd like to think I've had a, a modicum of success over the last few years with a few things that I've done. I'm often asked, you know, what, what characterises an entrepreneur? I think there is no single thing because you look at different entrepreneurs and they've been successful for different reasons. Some have family money, some are, are very driven as, as individuals, some from education, some from, they have a great idea, um, some have a passion for customers. So I don't think there is an, an identikit. But for me, um, it, it, the secret of any success I've had is down to the fact that I get up every day and I go to work. And I mean, that's, that sounds like a rather mundane thing to say, but in the journeys that I've been on with um, a number of businesses, including Metro Bank and, and Atom Bank, you have good days and you have bad days. And you have good weeks and you have bad weeks. And you have good months and you have bad months. And the, the secret for me is just, you know, it doesn't matter how bad it is, I'll get out of bed. Even some days you just want to snuggle up in the duvet and go, yeah, it's all too much. Just get up and get on with it. 
And if Atom is a success... When Atom is a success. When Atom is a success, would it, do you envisage it will put Metrobank out of business? Well, they're, they're two very different business models. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I hope Metrobank floats very successfully because I'm still a big shareholder. But um, the reality is when, when I had the idea for Metrobank in 2007, it was a very different world. Um, remember that the iPad only came out in 2010. And, I, and I'm not claiming to be particularly digitally prescient. Because I remember, I remember when the iPad came out, I went, what's the point of that? Mm. Who's going to buy that? It's got no keyboard. It's, you know, what's the point of it? Mm. And now between my wife and the three kids, I think we've got six of them. Right. <laughs> so um, the, you know, the world has just changed at an extraordinary rate. And it, it's a bit like, I think the challenge for the existing banks, it's a bit like the old joke, how do I get to Dublin? Well, well I wouldn't start from here. Um, it is, you know, they've got to make the most of what they've got, which is, you know, some legacy real estate and some legacy technology issues, and, and try and transition into a new world. We had the, we're fortunate we could start with a blank sheet of paper and create what we thought was a bank for the new world. But then there's, there's probably guys in this room who are waiting to eat my lunch. Because there's, as I say, nobody's got a monopoly on that customer relationship. Mm. Somebody comes along with somebody better, the customer will move. Anthony Thompson, Joey Cousy, thank you both very much indeed. <laughs> Your pleasure,